Okay, so welcome evening webinar three, last one of our little mini series here. Uh, what should coaches want to be developing? Um, actually, hang on, let me check. I've got the uh, sound options set up properly. Yep. Okay. There's a few more videos, um, short videos in this one than uh, we've had in some of our other sessions. So uh, I understand at your end, potentially the videos might be a little bit laggy. And uh, if you if you miss any bits, then my recommendation would be just catch up on the YouTube video tomorrow because the, the videos flow a little bit better on that end and it sort of records it as if it's looking from, from my end. Um, but I'm hopeful that you'll be able to grasp what we're sort of trying to illustrate with the use of the videos. Uh, Zoom rules as previous, keep your microphones muted um, so we don't get any background noise. And uh, obviously it's recorded and um, take as many photos or any notes as you want to have. And those that are uh, potentially new for this evening session, uh, my name is Danny Shepherd. I am the technical director and head of football for Bills Football Association. Um, enjoy doing these sort of sessions and sharing some skills and, and knowledge and experience and get some, some new sort of things from, from other people that I get to talk to. So these sort of forums are, are great. Normally in a real world, we're, we're out in the park or in a room having a chat, but we do the best we can uh, in these scenarios. Uh, I deliver a lot of coaching courses as well. So it sort of ties in together from uh, experience. Um, and yeah, plenty of coaching experience across uh, not only um, Australia, but uh, coaching in the UK as well. But uh, I won't bore you too much with, with that. And uh, introduce a uh, counterpart as well this evening. We're very fortunate again to have Warren um, come back with us we didn't scare him off last week um so it was thanks for thanks for coming on board again it wasn't definitely not me being uh, scared off might be the other way around scared a few people off by coming back this week uh thoroughly enjoyed it last week got a lot out of it and um, great to see the association being proactive and providing these types of events it's certainly something that has become the the way of the world recently uh, whilst we're, we go through the, these difficult times and I hope everyone that's on tonight and then for the ones that will be watching at a later date are keeping safe and well. Uh, in, in terms of my background, uh, some may or already know uh, that I currently as a technical director of Football New South Wales have been in the role for three years now and worked across multiple member federations, Football West, Capital Football, uh, and again, doing various different technical directors roles, either in the, the W League with Cambria United, uh, in the ACT with Capital Football or in the NPL with Manly United. Uh, not only from a coach development or player development point of view, do I work across those uh, various different organisations, but also with the FA and delivering the advanced coaching courses. But one of the, uh, the, the areas that I really still thoroughly enjoy delivering sessions on is, is that grassroots and that community level. I'm a big believer in participation, uh, but not only ensuring that we continue to grow the game with the numbers that we have and keep the popularity of the sport, but continue to grow the base where it is fun, engaging and safe for the players and uh, when you first reached out to me, Dan, about doing these uh, webinars and, and, and this style of event, I, I think they're absolutely fantastic. And for them to be recorded and for coaches to be able to go back into it at a later date are invaluable. And I certainly find that uh, myself for, from being one a part of these types of events, but also watching other ones that are taking place either around the country or the world right now. Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it was... Uh... Not only plenty of associations doing it around Sydney at the moment, but yeah, across the world, isn't it? It's just the, the way we have to be. Absolutely. So uh, our agenda this evening, uh, we'll be talking about sort of the behaviours of, of coaches and then sort of what the core skills are uh, and, uh, and then break down those individual core skills. So... You don't scream at your kids when they're learning how to read or write. So why do we do it when they're learning how to play football? Um, 
I think that's a, a really powerful sort of saying that, yeah, well, as soon as we as parents get down to the field, we, we, we start shouting and from the sideline, it's do this, do this, do this, do this. But I think more than ever with home learning and homeschooling, we, we, we understand that that's not how children are used to learning every day of the week. Um, so there's times obviously down on the park where we do need to be louder to project our voice to make sure that we're heard over a distance and, and bits and pieces. And there's lots of other activities going on that can um, sort of get in our way or, or sort of challenge um, to be heard. So we understand that. Uh, but in terms of how we interact with the child uh, in particular, I'm trying to make sure that we have a, a behaviour that's sort of going to lead us towards an outcome that we want that uh, hopefully is with the individual learning. And in most cases, individuals are going to learn best when they feel uh, valued, uh, that they enjoy this, their surroundings, that they, they're there, that they, that they feel like there's uh, that extra motivation, not just fear factor or um, and feel like the individuals have their own, uh, an element of control as well, not just do what mum or dad or what coach tells me to do and I have to follow that instruction. Um, I need to have a, my own creative freedom to some extent. I've got a video here um, from the English FA. Um, so if uh, we all just want to pay attention to this, the sound should be fine. Touch! Touch! Well done, Come on! Hi there, I'm Gareth Southgate and we're here at St George's Park today to launch the Pledge for Positivity to show mutual respect not only within grassroots football but in society in general. This morning we've got a team of young footballers coming down with their parents. We're going to see the impact of positive coaching on the level of their game and their enjoyment. Super break, well done. Shane here is going to coach the other team and take a slightly different approach. Who's marking him? Who's marking him? So we will have a perfect case study to see the impact of positivity and it will be very interesting to see how much more the kids not only enjoy playing but actually play better when they're encouraged. Now, I know today's a bit of a kickabout and a bit of a laugh, but it's also football, so I'm expecting a performance. Really, I just want you to go and enjoy yourselves. Show me what you can do. Leave it all out on the pitch. No embarrassments. Let's encourage each other and um, you can make these old boys run around a bit, can't you? Okay. Well pressed, Ruben. Well pressed. Well done, Joe. Great save. Great Got save. Got quiet. Come on. Got lucky there. Got lucky. Oh, nice. well played. Super break. Well done. Nice finish, Joe. Thank you. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Come on. Lovely touch. Lovely touch, Joe. Pick it up, yeah? Lovely Too easy, ball. too easy. What a great pass. Ah, oh, great stuff, nice. Jack. Super pass, Joe, as well. OK, boys, very good. How did you find it? Walk in the park. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I don't know why you're laughing. That, that was embarrassing. It's embarrassing. It's too quiet. There's no talking, hardly any movement. You stood still. You got a four on one it's the first half. You're lucky to be two nil down. I love it when you come in into the, into the centre. So you come off your man. So what, what you notice, if, if you start on your man, because they can't run very fast, if you start on them and come off, they don't pick that up very well. So that's the best way of finding space. And when we've, when we've played into your feet, you've played those little lovely round the corners, those little one twos are causing them a real problem. Get stuck in there, you boys. You're never going to hear the end of this at all, are you? Mm -hmm. Come on, get come your on. passing right. Off you go. Come on, boys, come on. Well done, right, Jack. Well done, right, lovely right, turn. Right, Joe, just right, cover the back, well done. Come on! Well done. You're not even looking. He's run right past you. Again, touch, touch, touch! Well done, Jack. Come on! Lovely finish, Jack. Oh, they're 16 now, they're leaving it in on us. Get more physical, mate. Hold it up. Boys, it's too easy! Force him back. Just watch this runner, Joe. What's that? Who's that to? Why are you playing off the boards? Come on, lads. What are you doing? You're in defence. 
someone come a bit deeper. That's it. Well played, Jack. Too easy, lads. Get in there, get tight in. Oh, what a pass. Great lads. play. Come on. Lovely pass, Tom. Oh, it's terrible. Well done, gents. Some very good performances. I enjoyed the game. We do have a little confession to make. Shane is actually an actor. So I don't know if you noticed his approach in any way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Part of today's filming is around the partnership we've got between the FA and Nationwide around respect and positivity. So we obviously took different approaches to managing the two teams. All right, I'll stop it there. I think uh, we've highlighted uh, the point that the video is trying to make in, in that one. Um, and I think all of us have come up against, on the sideline, uh, a coach of a, of a similar behaviour at some stage along the line. Um, and looking at it relatively cold like we are from there, it seems quite obvious in which way that behaviour is going to um, lead towards better learning and better understanding from from a young group of players. Obviously, this video is very scripted uh, in terms of, I think we knew which team was probably going to win the game before they kicked off. Um, but it does sort of highlight that, as in many occasions, adults will behave that way, but they don't like being treated that way um, themselves. Um, so just, um, just a bit of food for thought there in terms of that one. Uh, Warren, any um, sort of thoughts on, on your take on that video yourself? Yeah, yeah, lots of um, thoughts on that. It's, uh, it seems to be common practice, especially in the youth ages, unfortunately, and it's something that the FA in particular have worked on for many, many years with this campaign now in, in terms of positivity. It was the Respect campaign uh, previously, uh, again, you, uh, using actors, but the harsh reality is, is that you don't necessarily need to use actors to actually see this being brought to life at the weekends around the grounds. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it does happen more often than it than it needs to, uh, and it's a great illustration of um, from a positive point of view. But also, I think it's important to note that not just to, when we're giving that positive uh, instruction to our players, there's also to ensure that the intent we see if they intend to do something but they don't necessarily execute it we, we should also be treating that as a positive and actually the fact that they've actually seen it they might not technically right now be able to do it but you're hoping as they move through their journey as a player in their, in their development environments they're exposed to those environments where there is that no fear of failure and they can express themselves it is about the individuals and we as we move through this presentation i think that's a fantastic start to just illustrate why it why we do what we do and always starting with the why as well in around sort of the development of yeah, that individual. Yeah, this side sort of touched on a couple of things that there that you mentioned already was um, in terms of uh, behaviours and, uh, and the why. So just as you have read through those, yeah. uh, sorry, you can skip skip back onto the next one. I've had a chance to read those. Just move to that next slide, Dan, and then you, you can take over from there in terms of what the why are the core skills. Like I say, just starting with that why is incredibly important. Yeah, so we've touched, uh, this is a slide we've used previously, um, and it's a good one just for showing the timeline of uh, where a player is within their football journey. Um, so we want to make sure that for a player to enjoy themselves, we need to deliver something that is appropriate for them. Uh, we can't go and uh, in a classroom, go and give a kindy kid year 12 schoolwork because developmentally they're at, they're at different levels. We don't have the grounding of modification and addition to be able to go and do algebra and things like that. And football's no different, right? that we need to be able to provide base work. First of all, just some understanding and some enjoyment and a love for the game, build it into a base level of skills and then build it into the tactical side of things. Uh, that we do know as adults that if we can coach our under eights team to have better defensive organisation, they're probably going to win more games. And if we can teach them how to play the ball, long ball into space where the quick guy can run onto it, they're probably going to win more games. But ultimately, 
is that going to be the best thing for your team and your individuals uh, understanding and development of the game overall just to be able to um, set them up in a way that it's going to take you a long time to be able to get defensive shape and understanding happening in the first place but then be able to um, I guess capitalize on just physical attributes that are going to be so uh, vast at certain age groups so uh, in those early age groups we want to see just learning by playing almost street football don't need much coaching just need a guidance of this is the activity we're going to do lots of individual touches on the ball lots of a uh, higher ball to player ratio moving into the skill acquisition phase where we really focus on building a solid foundation of technical skills and uh, and making sure that when players are ready at 13 14 to move into the game training phase they can execute that stuff because in a game training phase, you want to do playing out the back or midfield combinations or crossing the ball from out wide, all those sort of tactical sorts of things. If you can't pass the ball over 30 metres or 10 metres, it's really going to hinder actually the level of execution you're going to have with all of that. And once you get to those teenage sort of year groups, it's going to be incredibly tough to be able to catch up um, the technical side of the game. So we want to make the most of it whilst whether we have them in those sponges to be able to absorb that information uh, and be able to develop those those skill sets going forwards. So kind of similar to on to link into the, the last slide. So um, four sort of areas to consider uh, about why we would deliver uh, core skills in that sort of in those younger age groups. What's the technical level of your players? So if your players aren't technically very capable, there's no point in trying to teach them how to defend uh, as in shape or trying to do this, try and do that, because if you're turning over the ball a lot, you're always going to be defending. So let's try and bring that skill level up where they can compete uh, sort of player for player. And can they undertake a wide range of football skills and techniques? And if they can't, well, then keep on bringing that into it. Keep them keep on trying to broaden that horizon uh, that they can be a little bit more self-serving once they get onto that field. Players um, in those sort of younger age groups typically don't understand team play and sharing and roles and responsibilities on the field very much. They are very individual. So that's something you're going to have to assess with your team. What is the, the collective position of your team? Are they great at understanding? Are they very mature? Do they understand shape, which once they're out on the field, no, they, we know that they kind of huddle around like a little swarm towards the ball. Uh, and that's fine. That's developmentally appropriate. So rather than trying to force them to do something that they're not going to do, adjust your, your scenario slightly different and provide them with better skill sets in those scenarios where through that core skill delivery. Uh, physicality, are they capable to do up and down, backwards and forwards, get into shape, run here, run there. In the younger age groups, it's see ball, run towards ball, or see ball and run away from ball, or we'll look at the aeroplane that's, that's going around up above you. So, again, don't try and choose something that you're just not going to get much joy and success from. And then the social element. For a lot of that game training stuff, communication is very important about where you need to go and what you need to do. I don't know if you spent much time sometimes with eight, nine-year-olds. Their communication skills in terms of they can say what they want, necessarily what the, what the group want is very different. And then understanding uh, and applying an instruction that one of their teammates gets them, gives them, that's very tough. That The players in those age groups are still in a position where if someone of my own age tells me to do something, they feel like they're being bullied or picked on uh, a lot and it don't, they don't understand that element of uh, that team organisation quite yet. So those four corners that we've got there really support showing why um, it's important for individuals, uh, for coaches working in that age group to make sure that um, we're delivering something that is age appropriate within our players. Just uh, Dan, just can you just go back back to that previous slide as well? Because yep. uh, just to just to touch on, there is obviously a fifth um, 
I, I believe there's a fifth one as well. And it's not only technical, but there is that tactical. Even in this age group, there's still where we, the focus isn't on the ta tactical. We can still provide challenge to the players whereby they start to understand how to stay connected either as a back line, distances, how do they stay connected to the midfield line and the front line? How do they work as a unit when they're in the ball, with the ball? When they have possession of the ball, do they go wide? Do they make the pitch nice and big when they're defending? Do they make it compact? But that's not the real focus. The focus, like you say, is on that individual technique and developing those techniques as well. I think it's really important to understand this age and stage and, and the physical seems to be the one that's most prevalent in this age and stage from what we see certainly around the, the, the fields in New South Wales. There is some very, very good practice, but certainly from a selection point of view, are we just picking players because they have the physical attributes now, but eventually players will catch up. So if we're looking at players that do show potential technically, or we work with players to develop them individually to improve their technique is what's going to give us a better chance. And, and I think as we, we look at players and their journey as a player moving through our pathways, there will always be the ones that want to just play that community level of football, but there will also always be the ones that want to aspire to that next level and, and give themselves an opportunity to test themselves to be the best they can actually be. So we have a responsibility to understand the agent stage we're actually working with and then what are the types of techniques that we're looking at. If you relate it to the, the Ollie Roos and the Matildas current, uh, recently at, at the Olympics, we are bridging the gap. Uh, year on year and we're starting to see that you only had to watch the Matildas last night to actually see uh, some of the technical abilities of the players to be able to, to spray the ball whether that's Van Egmont picking the ball up and switching it out to Hayley Rasso as an example or Caitlin Ford picking the ball up and being able to roll players protect the ball and getting into good positions those are skills or techniques that have been developed over a length of time and even though that this is if you want to move to that next one now Dan even this, though this is the, the golden age of, of motor learning, and we talked to this last week as well, where they are sponges, they do absorb it, they do retain it more. Technique is something players are always going to need to develop, and that's technique not just on the ball, but off the ball as well. How do you get yourself into a position where you're able to, to understand or be aware of what's around you? When do you step in front um, of a player to take your first touch away from them into space and, and being aware uh, from that point of view, if we can start to embed that in our practices at an early age is what's going to stand the players a better chance and ultimately us as a nation a, a better chance to, to be successful at that, at that top, top end as well. So as you move through through all of these, the, that, that skill acquisition phase and, and then linking it into the, to the social phase, I like to go full circle again um, about it is fun, engaging and, and players want to come back ultimately. And if you, if you can create that type of environment through a game structure, um, but also having the elements of challenge all the time. In, in the sessions with the core skills. I mean, we, we, we talk to the core skills all the time and they will intertwine in between your sessions. It doesn't matter whether it's 1v1 running with the ball, striking the ball a first touch. Uh, are we ensuring that there's potentially a focus on one of those techniques? And then we're giving players an opportunity to explore, get repetition, of, but making sure that it's always realistic and relevant to the session that we're actually, uh, or the outcomes we're looking for from those sessions that we're actually delivering as well. So again, I've, I've talked to that age and stage. Uh, is it age appropriate? Uh, do we understand what level of player we're actually working with? Do we understand what information they'll retain? What types of terminology that we'll have to use? Again, positive reinforcement, uh, but positively reinforcing intent as well. So even if they don't execute um, or they don't manage to actually pull off the pass, the fact that they've actually seen the pass is incredibly important. So give them that confidence to want to try that again and not stifle their development by telling them why you're taking that extra touch why are you looking to play a pass out of the back line why are you trying to do uh, things that potentially might seem a negative but if they get repetition and they're put in an environment where they're getting to test themselves and challenge themselves and coming up with different solutions you're hoping eventually that they will crack it and they will see it and then they'll start to be able to execute it further down the the, the, the track and then that leads into that that trend the one off um, so, again, if, you, if you're working in 1v1, as an example, 
we want to ensure that we have that that relevance we have that realism but most importantly there's repetition of that 1v1 happening if there's always one attacker there's always one defender so where in particular are you trying to create 1v1s is it in a wide area and therefore are we ensuring in the practices that we actually design it's given us many many opportunities to one to to have possession of the ball but to work the ball into positions whereby we can start to create those types of 1v1s etc and then that big problem versus a small problem. And again, just encouraging that no fear of failure uh, in the environments that you actually create. So into um, the discovery phase, so our, our youngest uh, little sponges that we have running around out there. Um, so the emphasis on natural development and, and then try to play and explore for themselves. Um, so not only is that technically suitable to, to players of that age group, but it's also um, mentally suitable because they don't they can't comprehend too many layers of instructions and they don't normally have the technical skills because they've only just started to be able to do a wide, a wide range uh, of the game. So the two core skills that are recommended to work with players or focus sort of on within those sort of age groups is first touch and running with the ball. They are very sort of individually um, thought players. So they want to do a lot of stuff themselves. They don't want to pass the ball too much. And technically, they don't have the range of, of pass to make it. And shape-wise, you look at them during a game and they're huddled up. So they are like a little swarm of bees. Um, so try not to, to fight against that. We've got a little video here of uh, an under seven snippet of a game that sort of just highlights that. Very short snippet there of that. That's actually in a real live game um, that uh, that these two teams were were playing, and you can see that yeah, there's players in space, and but the technical skills for them to be able to execute things is very limited. So, um, give them the skill set where they can phase in and out of the game, and that, and they can try and do things as, as they suit. And just because they are physically more capable, of it, that's not the the be all and the end all. And you're going to have players that stand around, look at the aeroplanes uh, and phase in and out of the game as they get tired. So if you move out of the discovery phase and into that skill acquisition phase, and then again, going back to that golden age of motor learning, uh, focusing on building and developing a solid foundation is incredibly important, that that range of technical skills that can be used within the game. So be thinking about if it's first touch, um, or any of the four core skills, where on the, on the pitch are you, you actually looking to improve it? So where do they need to take a first touch? If it's working out of a, a back line and then through hidden learning, how you're actually setting up your sessions where they have opportunity uh, to potentially move the ball from the goalkeeper into one of those defending players, where do they need to take their first touch depending on where pressure's coming from? If it's coming from in front, do they, are they able to go back? Uh, are we starting to create environments where there are potentially bigger distances in this age group to give them opportunity to practice taking that first touch to give them an element of success to start with? Um, and, and again, if you work your way through, I would be challenging coaches to actually think about all the different techniques uh, a player may need if they're working in each of the thirds of the field. And then what types of player do we want to actually develop at the top end and then work our way all the way back and, and really bring that back down to basics of giving the players the tools in their toolbox to be able to go out, test themselves on those core skills and give themselves the opportunity to one, succeed. But as soon as they're able or in a position where they are succeeding and noting that every player is different on their journey and the bar will be higher for one than the other, how do we ensure that we cater to both of those players with the environments that we create? And when is the right time to step in? When is the right time to keep the flow of the session and ensure that the players are still getting opportunities to practice all the time in that safe environment? So we've just got another video now showing players in a skill acquisition phase.
Dan, you just want to just play that through one more time and just give them a, uh, give them an opportunity to watch it and then just we'll watch it again. So again, as we've mentioned already, you've got here a situation where all of the four core skills are going to intertwine. Uh, the, the pitch is nice and big, so it gives players uh, the potential to have good touches because of the spaces and the angles that they're receiving the ball. Lots of opportunity to good, take good first touches facing forward. The speed of the ball and the passes, but being comfortable and confident on the ball when they're where they're taking those touches to. Uh, and this uh, essentially, even though this is actually a game itself, be thinking how do we actually encourage training sessions whereby these opportunities are allowed to take place where they can move the ball between the lines, uh, getting good first touches out of their feet. It might actually be if they can actually see space in front of them. When do they drive in? It doesn't matter whether they're a defender or a winger. If they've got space in front, are we encouraging them? Then what are the types of techniques that you actually need once pressure comes to you? When do you speed up? When do you slow down? But again, thinking about the individual techniques uh, within each of those training sessions. And then most importantly, when we're judging success, it should actually be around the focus of our week has been only on first touch and running with the ball. So when the weekend in this particular phase, I'm a big believer that that's what we should be actually judging the players on is them actually successfully over and over again, uh, demonstrating that they're taking good first touches into space. When they recognize that there's space, they can drive into that space and they're technically uh, becoming more uh, adaptable as to how they actually push the ball out of their feet and be creative to eventually get into either 1v1s or move the ball on uh, and striking the ball. And obviously that's, a, I mean, a great example of patient build-up in even that younger age with a goal at the end. The other thing um, to link back into the start of this presentation as well is the coach, you don't hear him screaming, telling them what to do and, and how to do things and, and where to go. You actually don't hear the coach comment until the ball's gone in the back of the net and he's praising them on good team play rather than actual the goal as well. Yeah, but, uh, and I also, just to add to that, I think it's important that training potentially is for the coach. Uh, that's where you get to, to make um, or, or create environments and make sessions where you are starting to encourage those different types of techniques. And then our roles as a coach is to actually facilitate the game day to actually see whether the players have actually are now bringing it to life. Uh, that's their time. That's their chance to, to get out there and, and not potentially be in a structured training session with all the different elements and components that are involved, but we're actually out on the field and have any opportunity to bring it to life. And if you have a, a good structure, or a season plan that works on that. With these young players in particular, you have a, a, a great deal of time to be able to work with them and push them through on their journey uh, from that under nines through to under 13s before they actually step into that game training phase. Okay, so first touch. This is our first of the core skills that we're going to sort of look into uh, a little bit deeper. So in terms of definition, uh, first touch is the time or an occasion when a player looks to bring the ball, uh, makes, makes first contact with a ball, uh, and normally it's requiring that player to bring the ball under their control for them to then complete another football action afterwards. Um, obviously, uh, there's a slight merge that potentially they could play a first-time pass or a first-time header, uh, and that sort of has um, a connection with striking the ball as well. So we typically think of first touch as uh, bringing the ball under control, which you can see the uh, the young girl in the photo sort of looks like that she's about to try and uh, cushion the ball to bring it down onto the ground. And that's the sort of the aspect that we're looking at coaches as first start thinking about in terms of first touch, how you control the ball. Uh, and then you need to, the next layer of that is what's the game scenario uh, that brings that and why is first touch important? first touch within the back third and the front third are going to be very different depending on where players are uh, and opposition and where the ball is. Same as receiving a first touch in the middle of the field is going to be very different to receiving it out wide. And there's going to be elements where it's not just uh, a one size fits all. Uh, just because it can bring a, a, the ball down and it sticks to my foot doesn't mean it's necessarily a great first touch that there could have been 20 metres of space out in front of me. So my first, first touch to have in that scenario could have been push the ball out in space and, and then and then it transforms and morphs into a running with the ball scenario. Uh, so it does depend on 
um, what's happening around the players as well. And we want to make sure that players have a skill set where they can control the ball in a variety of ways, be it inside of the foot, sole of the foot, with a player on them, player in space, front foot, back foot, um, touching into space, touching forwards, uh, all th- sort of scenarios like that. There's a, here's a couple of examples of technical points that as a coach, you might want to talk to your players during your training session. Uh, so while the game is, is happening or while your training session is happening, you, you might want to ask your players to move their feet so that they're not stretching, they're not, um, not a lunge into the ball. They might need to correctly uh, control the ball to correct part of the foot. And that can be situational. That can be coaching philosophy. Um, and that can be skill set as well. So if I'm really good at what, on one side of the field, be for example, my right foot rather than my left, I might favor taking the ball towards the right because I'm stronger to be able to do something afterwards. However, we probably as a blank canvas want to be able to teach our players that they should be good enough to go left or right because the outcome should be the one that's best for the game, not just best for my skill set. If I'm front of goal, it shouldn't matter really if I'm shooting my left or right. I should be selecting the shot with the best scenario, what's, what should have the, the highest outcome of a, uh, of, a, of a goal. And that shouldn't be just because I'm stronger on one foot or the other, but it should be dependent on the defenders and the positions of the keeper uh, and everything like that. So I'm not going to go through all eight points there, but this is where you as a, a coach have your little flavor that you can bring into them. Uh, and you can start to really try and get quite granular with first touch with your players. And you can take a bit of a microscope approach and go, right. So in this scenario, uh, who's around you? There's four players around. So can I have a first touch that goes away from them and we can keep the ball with someone else in this scenario? It's a one V one Good. Can I have a first touch that takes me forwards? And if you've got the, the knowledge and the understanding of what builds up that skill, then you can go and start delivering that. Um, if you're perhaps a, a less experienced coach or a newer coach and you don't feel like you have the understanding of all those layers that go into first touch, well, my other exa- uh, scenario would be use a player to, to help you with that. Is there a role model of a, a player within that team that is doing that quite well? And you can use them to help teach other players you might see a scenario where someone ha- does have a really good first touch and then rather than always picking up the negative and say you did this bad in this scenario could you do this better all right great stop there steve you had a really good first touch there what did you do why did you do and you can ask questions in in that space and if you don't if you're not too sure the players can sometimes give you the answer and that's something that you can add uh, down the track as well for for someone to coach your players um, as well so I've just got a little video here that highlights some, uh, some first touches and some, some moments in the game where um, they might be useful and moments where coaches can have a look and think, right, did we bring the ball under control effectively there? What could we have done better? Just lost uh, sight of the ball there from the through pass from Raul. Oh, goodness gracious. Did you see that control there from Zidane? Salgado tira el desmarque por delante Zinedine Zidane. Recibe el galo cerca de la frontal, controla 1-2-3. Normal time, it's still nil-nil, but both sides making chance oh, after chance. chance. And here's another one, Zinedine Zidane, across the area. Consiguió sacar el Guera de cabeza. Vamos a ver Zidane cómo controla. Madre mía. So just very, uh, very quick example there, and not a bad person to, to model off in terms of first touch. And um, I was quite happy with that video because it showed laces, inside of the foot and outside of the foot in a variation touches. The only thing we missed off was a bit of futsal with the, with the sole of the foot to, for a first touch, but uh, just showing how obviously a good first touch can set up the next stage and understanding who and what is around you in order to maximize your first touch. So the next one that's uh, next core skill is striking the ball. And this refers to the moment when a player is intentionally releasing the ball from their own control, their own possession. So striking the ball includes techniques or actions such as passing, shooting, crossing, heading. So anything where you're striking the ball that is going from you to another player. Um, And potentially the largest of the core skills in terms of the most techniques that can be brought up to that 
but that's uh, that's a matter of opinion in terms of how you're going to use that um, and uh, how you're going to educate your players on what you want them to do and what they can do, what they're capable of to be at page and stage uh, of their football uh, journey as well. Just something of note to make there, I added down the, down the bottom about heading. Um, so in terms of heading and coaching players in these age groups to, to undertake some heading, coaches need to be sensible with their conduct of heading uh, and be aware of that there is a possible future risk uh, of players in terms of concussion and, and head knocks down the track. Um, so we ask players to be safe, uh, coaches to be safe with that. Uh, if you are feeling like you need to do uh, a bit of heading, we strongly recommend the Heading Pro Ball, which is a, a lighter ball. It still travels and feels like a regular football. It's not a cheap plastic one that you'll just see from Kmart. It actually does feel like a proper football. Uh, it's not durable enough to use for a, a match ball or a full-time training ball, but you'd probably only need one or two of them. And you can then whip out the ball, do a couple of headers uh, with less risk associated to those players. Uh, but in terms of, of doing headers, um, there's two factors really do, to be concerned about. First one is uh, the sensible and safe side of things. If we're, um, as a coach, dropping, doing a drop kick and shelling the ball 20 metres, 30 metres up in the air and then asking the 10-year-old to get on the end of it and head it, is that particularly safe? Uh, is that teaching good technique or should we be bringing players a metre or two away from each other and gentle underarm throws, worry about good technique and making sure that we're not getting bloody noses and, and hitting on top of the, of the head and, and things like that. And then the second element to that is just the, the realism and the... Um, appropriateness or the, the big problem, small problem scenario. The English FA's research found that on average in a youth football game across the season, there was one and a half headers. So at best, or not maybe not best, at the most, you've probably seen two headers in a youth football game uh, in their research. So if there's only two headers per game, is it really a skill that we need to focus that much time and attention on in the younger age groups? If you're doing four headers as a player in those youth age groups, um, a training session, you've already done more than double than they're, they're going to do in a game. So um, recommendation is big problem, small problem. Yeah, we might want to teach them the, the correct technique. So that one occasion they do have to go and head the ball. They don't end up with a bloody nose or they end up doing it completely wrong and, and compress the spine or something. But we only need to do one or two um, at, at the most uh, going forwards. Dan, can I just add to that as well? Mm, that okay. um, 1.5 uh, is a statistic in potentially in the UK, also France, Germany, um, and, uh, and many clubs in and around Europe uh, that have actually moved away from 11 v 11 football in the younger age groups. Um, it still baffles me that we here in, in Australia still in some uh, competitions, uh, states, territories still play 11 v 11 football uh, at, at this particular age group, which actually encourages more heading um, and encourages picking more physically, um, pl physical players, sorry, because they have the ability to be able to strike the ball. They have the ability to be hit the ball over longer distances, which actually means the ball is in the air more often, which means there is the chance for players to head the ball more often. When you move to the small-sided formats, that starts to eliminate opportunities to really strike the ball too long uh, and headers to actually take place where so it comes down and therefore the risk actually comes down. And also uh, 11 v 11 versus 9 v 9, uh, the, the advantages out, outweigh completely playing 9 v 9 versus 11 v 11 because players have to come up with different solutions because there's less space and less time. The ball more often than not will stay on the floor more often and, and be moved around or it'll be up in and around sort of like waist to, to chest height but not very often will it be up in the air unless the goalkeeper is actually kicking the ball from their hands um, so they're the considerations that that we also need to make it's something that I've, I've been really encouraged by the Hills FA um, in, in particular I've, I've gone to a 9v9 format 
uh, and hopefully moving forward there'll be they're not the only association which is absolutely fantastic but we're hoping that that more associations start to take that um, and, and look at that and actually say, are we putting the player's safety first um, and ensuring that they're actually playing if it is a competition structure in a safe environment that's either 7v7, 8v8 or 9v9 as opposed to 11v11, especially in these younger age groups, I think it's incredibly important. And 10v10 because we have 10v10 in the under 13s goals as well. So here's a couple of uh, examples of technical points uh, that you as coaches might want to make for your players. Um, moving feet, getting your body in the way, what part of the foot, which is obviously situational, depending on where the ball is, where they are on the field. Uh, the correct foot, which I slightly mentioned beforehand. Um, ideally, we want to coach players that they will use the foot where the ball is situated, not just my strongest foot, because that's a bad habit that we have all got into as we've got older. Uh, and now we want to try and balance that out as much as possible. If the defender's in front of me on my right foot, can I touch it to my left and have a shot with my left? Because that would be what would be best in that scenario. And we see the best players in the world still have a favourite foot. Obviously, Messi's still left-footed, Ronaldo still right-footed. But if they need to use their other foot because the situation is better, more times than not, they would do that and rather than trying to chop back onto their stronger foot and lose the opportunity to have a shot at goal. Uh, body positions, weight of pass, angle of pass, um, what's the best one, direct pass at goal, build up. There's lots of elements that you as coaches can bring your own flavor within and there isn't a one size fits all. So we need to be able to do that, but you need to be able to understand where to put that in to the game and what the outcome is. So quite often we'll hear from the sidelines, um, kick it long when that's in most cases not the scenario that we want to have because that doesn't show creativity. That doesn't show understanding of where the game at and where the opposition is. It doesn't show um, understanding of what decision to make from individual players or, or how they execute those, the range of techniques we need to get the ball from A to B through a number of players uh, rather than just Hopefully, uh, it is over the top of someone and, and, the, and the fast guy runs onto the ball. Uh, so we want to make sure that we can build that up within. And then the, the last one probably then is about the reward from a coach to, to the players. What sort of encouragement and praise do we provide and why? And then on the, on the other side of that is what's the negative reaction? If a player does give away the ball because they're trying to play a short combination, well, uh, do we reward the intention or the idea? Do we bark and scream at them because they gave the ball away? Do we tell them they can't pass across the goal mouth, which is very, very common. Players will come and say, don't pass across the goal. Well, if that's true, then we're never going to score a goal because the ball's always got to be on one channel all the way up the field, and then we're never going to get it back to the middle to score the goal because the goals are in the middle, right? Um, but it's more about understanding, well, why was that a good occasion to pass across the goal? Why is that a bad scenario? Oh, because they're, they're highly pressed. Great. And that's potentially the, ta the tactical stuff from game training. So if you can start to bleed in, particularly with 12 and 13-year-olds, understanding the, the scenario of where they can and how and why they can use that, that core skill to their best effect. Uh, I've got another example here of, um, of some striking the ball try to keep the ball, we try to, to play with the ball, we try to, to, to make everything with the ball. There is Lionel Messi, holding people off, Lionel Messi! Strictly sensational, possibly. That is more than special from James Madison. Set back for Pogba, oh what a finish! That is one belter of a derby goal from Son Jung Min. Let's see it! So obviously, um, we're not expecting too many of our little eight, nine, ten-year-olds on the weekend to go and score goals like that and combinations like that. But uh, where do we think those players started from? Um, what sort of foundation did we think that those coaches at that time uh, allowed their players to to start and build on until they were at the stage where now they can do that stuff on the on the highest level? Just to add to that, striking the ball, and it will lead into this running with the ball as well. Um, I really, really enjoy um, 
showcasing uh, good practice, best practice at the top, top level and role playing players, actually seeing if players actually see the, the players doing it at the top, top level. I think we now live in a society where, unfortunately, young players don't watch enough football. Um, a lot of the examples um, that we've seen there at the top, top end and some of the best leagues in the world, but how many of our players are actually watching those games? And that can be for a whole raft of reasons, obviously, the time of games taking place, etc. But they're easy access easily accessible um, on YouTube and, and looking at what is a, a top, top player right now and actually really using them as a role model um, and, and even drilling down to our, to our local leagues, our A League, our W League, etc. And, and getting examples of those players striking the ball. Uh, it, and that's a, a, a technique in itself. And if you looked at a few of those examples, when it's a finish on goal and Pogba's one in particular, it's actually bending the ball around a player to actually get the ball in the back of the net. But are we actually encouraging those types of scenarios in our training sessions, even at the younger age? If you look at the, the Barcelona clip and you look at the Lionel Messi in particular and players being comfortable uh, in tight spaces with less space and less time, the only way players will actually get better at being able to do that is being in those scenarios over and over again and us creating environments where they are exposed to that and there is that no fear of failure where they are able to make mistakes but we are slowly starting to give them little snippets as to how do you actually start to eliminate the, eliminate those mistakes and you start to get more successful outcomes and again noting players are on a different journey and their bar will be at a different height what do we then give to the individual to allow them to still develop regardless of where they are uh, player a versus player b um, and that's no in no difference to, to any of the core skills and then just leading into that to that running with the ball. So I love to see examples from the top level. We've seen some from the very, very young age moving into that skill acquisition phase. But to Dan's point, which is absolutely fantastic as well, is that these players have come from somewhere. So you, you look right now at the, a player's journey. Hopefully they've been exposed to a positive environment where they've had the opportunity to really work on these different techniques and these bullet points uh, that are being provided tonight are little bits of gold dust. And then how do we actually potentially just take one or two of those bullet points and create training sessions? And we have effectively, certainly in this phase, uh, a great deal of time of, of four or five years to be able to work with those players. But note in the fact that a player's technique will never cease to, to continue to develop uh, and what's the, the, the fine balance between doing a more holistic approach to your training sessions where there's perception, decision-making, execution all the way through, and then potentially what's the homework for the players to actually work on their individual technique? Um, are we giving them them opportunities to actually go away and practice and come back and actually show our coaches as to what they've done in their own time? Uh, and again, modern society is probably a little bit different to these days, but so we have to add that element of street football in and set them challenges outside of our training environments because the reality is we only have limited time with those players, some only once a week, twice a week, and if you're very fortunate, three times a week with a game at the weekend. So just into that running, running with the ball. Okay, so travelling with a ball at their feet um, away from an opposition player or into space. Uh, and again, there's there's some fantastic examples of this actually happening. What is the different type of technique? Players' awareness to understand, depending on where they are on the pitch, when is the right time to run with the ball? How do they actually run with the ball? And then what are the technical points that are leading to this as well? So just again, uh, with all of the others, uh, exactly the same. Can they uh, uh, attack with intent at speed? Um, and seeing the space is one. Uh, a lot of the time, even at the top, top level, when does a player actually get their head up and actually recognise what's around them? Where is pressure coming from? It's more often than not, not until they've actually taken their first touch. So again, are we encouraging players to have already be played in the future? Starting to think about where are they actually going to take their first touch? Their head's already up. They know where they're going to cushion the ball and they know that there's space either in front of them or to the side of them. And that's going to give them the opportunity to be able to attack with pace and run into those different areas depending on where that space is. What's the right foot? How often are players putting themselves into position or we encouraging players to be put into a position to work off of their weaker foot as well? Um, uh, or are they always just going on to their favoured foot? How do we actually develop scenarios within our training sessions will allow players to actually work both right 
and left foot. And then what are the little tips or challenges we can do to recognise where a player uh, might be uh, stronger on one foot versus the other. So a tip might be that you get them to wear two different coloured socks. One sock, coloured sock is for their strong foot. One sock is for their, their weaker foot. Uh, and not until they become uh, proficient in actually being as good with both feet are they allowed to wear this, the same coloured socks. So that, that, that's a, a tip that Ajax use in all of their uh, their, their academy programmes and, and a fantastic one to intrinsically motivate players to actually get better and get stronger and, again, having that element of challenge in there as well. Uh, and the, the, the weight of touch, where do they take the touch, depending on where that pressure is coming from? Is it with the instep? Is it with the toes? Is it with the sole of the foot to get it out of the feet? Um, I've seen it so many times before where we encourage players to take their first touch with the inside of their foot and, and discourage to actually take it with the sole of the foot. But yet you look at the South Americans and you look at futsal as an example. It's a classic example of being able to control the ball with the sole of the foot and stop not stopping the ball completely and keeping the ball moving, which allows players to actually push the ball out of their feet, attack at that speed and attack at that pace to give them the best opportunity to either move away from the defender or to get into a space where they start can start to create and convert goal scoring opportunities. Uh, and again, in this golden age of motor learning, the, the last one is is uh, the when would, do they need to release the ball? And they, they'll make mistakes and sometimes they'll take the extra touch. Sometimes they will run out of space and it'll go out of play, et cetera. But we should always be encouraging that, that no fear of failure and allowing them to come up with solutions themselves because eventually they will start to understand um, when and where to actually take those touches. And I, I talked a lot last week, not only to the relevance, realism, ensuring that there's repetition in all parts of your session, but the five W's um, starting with the why. Why are we designing sessions the way we are? Um, what and where on the field is that potentially taking place? Is it in central areas? Is it in the final third? And then who and when are we trying to develop? So the who and when is might that might be specific to our forward players, our attacking midfield players, and then what are the types of techniques? So it's not just running with the ball again, that first touch, striking the ball, um, and those 1v1 situations, which we'll lead into now. Jaden Sancho leads the charge for Borussia Dortmund. Sancho shifts through the gears. He's got pace and he's got Erling Haaland charging up in support. It's Erling Haaland! But managed to pick out Sancho and the charge is truly on here for Dortmund. Will it be a second? There's the answer. Jaden! So again, just profiling uh, players. And there's a, another one where not only running with the ball, but either getting into to 1v1 situations, slowing right down uh, and drawing defenders into that into him and either bringing players into play or actually executing the ball perfectly and putting the ball into the back of the net. So all elements of those core skills, again, first touch, out the feet, accelerate with pace, drawing players in, but then executing, uh, creating and converting goal scoring opportunities. And he, he's one of the, the bright sparks, the bright lights of world football right now. Uh, of being able to do that and, as, and very, very good at doing that as well. And um, obviously it'll be very, very intriguing to see how he goes at Manchester United this season as well uh, in the English Premier League. Uh, no, in the, the, the slight differences between the Bundesliga and the English Premier League in terms of the, the physicality uh, aspects of the game as well. So, so really looking forward to seeing how he goes. So the one, 1v1s, um, uh, again... Uh, what, what, what type of 1v1 situations? Uh, I, I think that there's always one attacker and one defender, uh, and we need, regardless of what the focus is on, either the attacker or the defender, to try and ensure that we create an environment that if our focus is on the attacker, what is the hidden learning for the defender? So even though um, we want to ensure that the, the attacker is committing players, looking to draw players in, potentially get in the space behind the player if there's space there, or draw a player in to be able to take the player on and then shift it onto a teammate, what's the hidden learning for the defenders in there? So there's got to be something, some type of carrot where they're attracted to actually want to step up to the challenge, to want to defend better. So depending, again, if you take that uh, five W's approach, the, the where and when, and you look at, so where are the, where's their less space? When do I show that player that's 
that's attacking the ball into the lesser space uh, as an example but how do we do that in a way where it's not stop stand still and showing players but obviously doing it in a manner whereby you're just challenging them where possibly could you show them to uh, and then why have you chosen into that to that area well there's less space that that might be one way of actually doing it so being clever with the terminology and the rules that we put into our practices and potentially having games within games um, as well so just the different technical points on on the 1v1 and and not trying to shift through these uh, too quickly but rather than just uh, keep blabbering on about them. Obviously, the, the, we'll be able to send this video out to you and you'll be able to access this again. And just the different types uh, of, of technical points. And again, these are very much heavily towards the player that is in possession. So we'll attack the defender at speed. Obviously, uh, you, you can't buy speed, but you can certainly develop speed. So how do you actually do that within your sessions as well? Do you have areas whereby there's channels for players to get used to once they receive it in their channel there's lots of opportunity lots of space in front of them just to develop that technique uh, speed on the ball and with the ball and giving them the opportunities to be able to do both uh, left and right foot as well so where are they actually taking that first touch which foot are they actually using is the head up or the head down are they getting uh, a mixture of both depending on where pressure's coming from but getting that game awareness as, as well uh, and back to the Sancho uh, examples in there is that accelerating at pace and the weight of touch of keeping the ball nice and close to his feet when defenders are coming close but certainly once that space is there and he's able to exploit that space pushing the ball out of the feet what parts of the foot is he actually using is it the laces and the toes pointed down uh, knee over the ball accelerating away and then when it comes close just bringing the ball in a little bit closer to shift that ball on as, as an example and, and getting a defender off balance um, as well so all of those things are to take into consideration but again if that's the attacker what are we going to give to the defender what are we going to look to do for those defenders to be able to defend in those situations um, as well uh, and thinking about those in these 1v1 situations to uh, if the job is for us to create and convert more goal scoring opportunities it's also for us at the other end to deny goal scoring opportunities and I think and uh, we can still have a focus on that in this particular phase as well if we're clever on how we actually set our sessions up through hidden learning the more remarkable that along with Barcelona and Real Madrid Athletic Bilbao have never been relegated yeah. from the Primera Division it's something to be admired I have to say well, there's three of them right, he's still going, look at this Kevin, it's a brilliant run from Messi, going to go all the way! The rain just continuing to fall as drizzle, it's not going to deter Cristiano Ronaldo, he's looking to release Higuain, PK's back. So some, uh, some good examples there again. Um, and I think one of the reasons I chose these videos of Messi and Ronaldo is often we think of 1v1s as having to do tricks to beat a player. And we just see in most of these scenarios, it's just quick movement, um, keeping it simple, um, manipulate the ball quickly, maybe throw some dummies in, but we don't need to be having legs going all over the place and super inventive with tricks. We can, we can just be effective. So training session essentials, uh, obviously make sure your, your sessions are safe, make sure you've got the right setup that's happening, um, your, and obviously things like safe in terms of equipment, we touched on with heading already, um, but really make sure your balls are pumped up appropriately, you've got goals, you, you've got your cones marked out, ready to go uh, with your organisation, and that they're making sure that you're, you've got a, a plan that's going to happen, that it's going to flow from one to the other, that there's not going to be wasted time. Players are going to be able to um, get a ball and start practicing the skills and the game elements that we want them doing as quickly as possible and for as long as possible. And that then is going to help with our enjoyable and engaging. Um, quite often when I deliver coaching courses uh, out in the community, one of the, my most asked questions is how do I stop the bad behavior how do I deal with these kids how do I communicate with them and my my first answer is always well how engaging is your session because if it's engaging then I've got most players doing what I need them to do 
and they're not trying to entertain themselves and they're not trying they're not distracting other people and then i've only got the the one here or there that is um maybe overtired from school or um, mum or dad fed them from sugar as they go out of the car or or most likely your own child the one that's misbehaving uh, if it's anything like my children when i coach them it's my own child that's the one that's misbehaving the most um so engagement really important to have them engage have them focus doing an activity that they enjoy so if they're standing on, on the line passing the ball backwards and forwards it's going to be a bit tedious but if you've got them all running around, trying to tag each other, stuck in the mud, lots of tackles, maybe a bit of bowling, knock over the cones, dribble to this end, score a goal, there's going to be a lot more of an engagement factor for the player, so which is then going to lead them to being a lot more, um, obviously, entertained with your session, um, better behave, but make it enjoyable. And if they're enjoying the session and they're walking away with a smile, and then even better walking away with a sweat on, uh, mum is going to and dad is going to be happy but the player is going to be happy as well and then we've got our return business for for our next session our next game and hopefully our next season as well yeah so we we see well we use this this slide a lot and again i'll talk to the the repetition relevance um, and realism in your sessions and then the the why the what the where and who and when but this is another great tool for us to be able to actually use to ensure that it is safe when we're setting up our sessions. Uh, sessions are organised. I know it's uh, time is of the essence and we're very, very time hamstrung in the fact that potentially we've got jobs outside of football and we don't have the time to, to plan a detailed session. Uh, so the biggest recommendation uh, from that point of view would be actually to uh, keep the sessions quite similar so that they're organized and that's not just organized from you being able to set up your sessions easily or the coaches that are under your guidance but it's also for the players not to have to learn a new practice every single time and therefore whilst it's taken them 10 to 15 minutes to understand what the passing sequence is there's an opportunity for players to be disengaged in that particular session but if we have got sessions where they're familiar with but we're able to change the rules only slightly uh, and then encourage challenge all the time so where they're challenging them themselves as individuals they're challenging each other um, as teammates and challenging the opposition uh, but doing it in a, in a safe fun environment uh, is incredibly important as well where the areas and the numbers that you're working with the rules that you actually put in and the equipment that you have and, and probably one of the biggest recommendations is to actually set your session up outside to win. So when players turn up to a session, I like to ensure in these particular ages and even with senior players now, goals in every single part of the session. Um, if the objective of the game is to score goals and then deny goal scoring opportunities, I think it's incredibly important for players to have targets to be able to hit or defend against. Uh, regardless of what component you actually are in the game. And that will actually engage players because they love to score goals and they love to stop goals going in the back of the net as well. If you start from outside to in, you finish in with the game. So effectively, you're only ever having to pick cones up or markers up or equipment up, whatever it may be. So then if you start from inside to out, you then take in the cones up, you do the first part of your session, you remove those, second part, however many components you have, but it's finishing with that game, but there's goals in every single part to give them the opportunity to stay engaged and then to work through those different techniques, whether it's first touch, running with the ball, striking the ball, a 1v1 in attack and defence. I think Dan's talked to this um, a lot. We, we hear it a lot, especially in youth football. You hear it in, in senior football where it might be the win at all cost uh, attitude that is prevalent and it's about getting the three points. But uh, clearing, clearing your lines, uh, and don't get me wrong, I still think that there's nothing wrong with players if they can see a pass and it is a, over a longer distance, but where they're actually looking to play a player into space on their first touch, where they can move into space facing forward, um, or even playing into a longer pass where they've got pressure behind, but they've got support underneath. There's nothing wrong with that type of pass, and that's still structured build-up. That's still players being effective and actually seeing that. Sometimes, like I've said before, they won't be able to execute it at this point, but the fact that they've got the game awareness and they can actually see that that option is on, um, that's what we want to encourage within the sessions. 
Um, try to take our egos out of it. We all want to win. The players want to win. But certainly in these younger age groups from a, a grassroots community discovery phase into the skill acquisition phase, judging success should be actually about what we've delivered throughout the week in our training sessions. And is that actually coming to life at the weekend with the games that are actually being played? And more importantly, the, it's about the individuals. So are they starting to develop as individuals throughout the season? Um, and, and I hear it all the time where players are actually released at 9, 10, 11. And it's not because they're misbehaving or they're not turning up to sessions or their attendance is bad. It's saying because they're not good enough. How do we know they're not good enough at that age? How do we know that they're not potentially going to be um, a, be a best player or a better player moving forward? Uh, and there's, I know of countless situations of players that have actually gone through their careers and ended up at the top level that were released at these younger age groups just because of the coach potentially wanting to win at all costs. So how do we actually develop the individual and then not only judge the player's success on what they're actually doing as individuals, but judging our success and placing our egos on how many players we're actually allowing to move through our development environments onto the next level and us being comfortable and confident that we've done a job uh, where it has been safe, fun and engaging for, for the players that are under our, under our guidance uh, with the, the football knowledge that we're trying to empower to those individuals as they take their journey as a player. Yeah, there's definitely a difference between um, clearing the ball out the back or just kicking it long and compared to playing a longer pass. And uh, in most scenarios, uh, what would you rather do? Play one pass and score a goal or play more and lose the ball or potentially score a goal? And, and in most cases, it's score as many goals as you can as quickly as you can. There's no um, surprise that Man City have the goalkeeper that has the most number of assists as well because... If they can go long and score, they'll score. But just kicking it away for the sake of kicking it away is something that's different. And um, we need to put players in a position where they can recognise why they would do one or the other. Put them in that scenario where they can make that decision. And if they can see goals from it at 10, 11, 12 years old, in the scheme of things, I don't think that's a big problem to have. Um, and we can, we can develop that over time. All kids need a little help, a little hope, and someone believes in them. Are you going to be that coach that believes in them, that provides them with the platform uh, to go and show what skills they possibly can, uh, develop what they do have, what difference they might, might make within that game, what difference they might make over uh, a longer journey? There was um, an article that I was reading today, actually, that said, um, summed it up quite well for me. I uh, hope I can remember it accurately now. Um, but it mentioned how adults are, are very fixated on um, getting results right now by, and by the end of the season and, and comparing, uh, particularly in a sporting context, how does my child or how does that child compare to everyone else in the age group and trying to get an even playing field or be the best one. But it, the article I was reading said, well, that's kind of falsifying because people travel at different stages at, at different speeds at different journeys um, and it should be more a question of not how can my player get as good as the best player on the team right now compared to is my player or is my son or daughter going to have the skill set or how long are they going to stay in this game for over the course of 30 years are we giving them the development uh, tools that um, first of all they have the enjoyment for the game that they want to stay in do they then have the skill set or foundation that in 10 years' time, 15 years' time, are they going to be pushing at a level that they potentially want to be playing at uh, instead of what can I do right now to become an A or a B student um, within that? Because we all know that the players do kick on at, at different levels. And, and often uh, it's not maybe different levels. It's maybe just the same level but with a different coach, a different playing style, a different... Um, different feeling and I've seen it many times before um, of players that haven't played m many minutes with one coach go to another coach and now they're the best player in the team uh, the player they get in the most minutes and that doesn't mean that they have to step down to go that way uh, just a, a different opinion and you can see it at the top level all the time um, look at the goalkeeper that left Arsenal last season to go to Aston Villa and uh, was he third choice fourth choice at Arsenal and after a season, Aston Villa is the number one choice for Argentina and, and makes a couple of saves for them to win the penalty shootout to win the, the Copa Americas. 
So it happens at all, at all levels. But in terms of you with your 10, 12 players, the younger players that you've got there, um, they need someone that's going to believe in them and make them feel like that they can execute and, and do stuff without the fear of getting yelled at or reduce game time. And, and um, if someone if, is feeling nervous, they're probably not going to perform at their top level uh, that they can deliver. So um, get them ready during a week, push them out, off you go. Players, go show us what you can do. Uh, and Gareth said that in his video with those young boys straight away. I just want you to go and enjoy yourself. So uh, my summary, um, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, we've got, in most cases, a player group that is very young, very naive, very eager, um, want to be uh, taught and shown, but more than anything, want to have fun and want to learn and just want to go and do stuff. Uh, so they, d they don't want to have lots of instructions. Um, so how can we use some of the either is a similar game to we've used every week that then just develops the different skill sets or how can it be something that is quite easy to get a demonstration out straight away and we can have every player kicking the ball uh, and actively participating in under 90 seconds and then we can bring different layers and different components into your session to make it more challenging as we need to go but we don't need to have uh, as the picture shows pass here pass here then run here then do this then do this then do that because They've forgotten about it uh, as soon as you've explained it. Um, so don't overcomplicate it. The game itself on the weekend is not complicated. There's a goal at each end. There's some some cones or a white line that goes around the outside and one through the middle. There's two teams that wear different colours, hopefully, and there's a round object. Um, the game itself is relatively simple, but we make it more complex. So... Don't feel like as coaches you need to come up with something that's brilliant and wacky and, and inventive and creative for every single session. Um, the game doesn't change on the weekend. That's very, very consistent every single week. The only thing that changes as they get older, more players get added and uh, the pitch gets bigger and the players get bigger. Definitely once you get into the over 30s and over 45s, the players definitely get bigger. And, um, and hopefully they start to run faster uh, as they get uh, and kick the ball further and do better things as they as they get more involved. So just take that as you go. Um, don't have to reinvent the wheel. So for yourselves, coaches, some resources. Um, same five that we've had across the previous couple of weeks, plus now the sixth yellow box there with the Heading Pro tutorials. So um, if you jump onto the Heading Pro website on with that link there, the tutorials page, it does show you a couple of examples of how to coach some heading exercises uh, that are safe and are um, sort of working on good educational technique background, first of all, before you sort of focus on to, uh, the, the real ball. Um, put some good places to put on there. And obviously, this uh, session will be on our YouTube page as well tomorrow. So before uh, last page, what's going to happen tonight? As soon as we finish um, our discussions at the end here, everyone's going to be sent an email with uh, the link to this webinar, uh, this questionnaire. Really appreciate it if um, you could fill in uh, your thoughts uh, around what's happened over these three weeks. Obviously, some of you might have only done one, two, or even hopefully a uh, majority have done uh, three sessions. There's 11 questions here. Um, if you just put as much information as you possibly can. Um, it will be really helpful for us to be able to better design any future content and being that um, we're in lockdown still for a few more weeks, we might be able to come up with something else uh, in a few weeks' time as well. So this will just help us better tailor the, the content and the information that we deliver towards what's relevant for you guys rather than myself or Warren or both of us as in here uh, having a chit-chat about what we think. Um, it's not about us. It's about you guys that are out there in... Um, down on the park each week when we're allowed to be uh, and dealing with our uh, young and bright, hopeful next generation of, of players to come through. And that's it from, uh, from, from myself. Warren, anything to add? No, thanks again uh, for the invite. It's been a pleasure to support and, and hopefully add something uh, to the terrific work that you're doing. Um, and said so obviously to the coaches online and, and furthermore the ones that potentially will watch this at a late date 
um, keep doing uh, the things that you're doing because there's positive change and it, it's really good to see uh, and keep up the good work and stay safe.